Come on, give Jesus a shout of praise. It's 5F Conference 2023. He deserves our praise. This indeed is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, give Him praise. You are highly exalted. There is none like you. The King of kings, the Lord of all the earth, the monarch of the universe. We celebrate your reign. We celebrate your reign. You are highly exalted. We give you all the glory. We thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of all our praise. You are worthy of all the adoration. We give you all the glory. We celebrate you, King of Kings. Isaiah 43, 18, verse 219. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now spring up, do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Revelation 21 5 says, He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and they are true. Come and give Jesus praise for that which is set to do in our midst. Give him all the praise, exalt his name. Thank him for the lives that's transforming. Give him all the praise for the shift in the spirit. Give him all the praise for the transformation in lives and destinies. Give him all the praise for all he's doing. He's transforming families. He's transforming our finance. He's transforming us. He's changing us. We are breaking into new realms. We are breaking into new realms. New realms of possibilities. In the name of Jesus. At this point, I want us to commit tonight's meeting onto God's hands. Commit the speaker onto God's hands and decree that God's word will go forth with power to accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. That every word will permeate the heart of man. We decree that your word will penetrate every heart. In the name of Jesus, bringing about transformation, bringing about men aligning with your will, with your purpose. In the name of Jesus, we decree and declare, oh God, that your word will bring about new births. In the name of Jesus, we decree and declare, oh God, that you will bring direction for as many that are lost, oh God, that you will realign them, oh God, with your purpose. In the name of Jesus, we declare and we decree and declare that you are transforming men, you are transforming women in the name of Jesus. And specifically, let us commit tonight's meeting unto God's hand as Reverend Tony brings forth the word concerning fitness that God indeed will begin to change us physically, spiritually, in the name of Jesus. That the words that will come out tonight, it will empower us to make that change in our lives, in our destinies, in the name of Jesus. And we declare this meeting open in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. We invoke the presence of heaven and anticipate a reenactment of 2 Chronicles 7 verse 1 to 3. And we decree that the glory of the Lord will fill this temple. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.
Halleluja. Hello, dear family, friends, and those joining us from all over the world. Welcome to this year's conference. I'm here to discuss with you about your health. And this is just to whet your appetite for the main meal of the day that will soon come. We want to talk about healthy living. And we need to realize that the subject of health should be of paramount importance to everybody. First, I want you to know that you can be in health. You don't have to be sick. And if you are falling sick, you can recover from any sickness or disease. As a matter of fact, you can live your life disease-free. God has not ordered disease to be part of your life from the beginning. We believe in our ministry that there are no incurable diseases. There are only incurable people that are unwilling to change their diet and lifestyle. So if you will pay close attention to your diet and lifestyle, definitely you will be in health. You need to know that your first health, your first word in life is your health. And that has been put together by that great American writer, Ralph Emerson. Your first wealth in life is your health. So if you have health, you are worthy. That is why you must pay attention to your health. And according to Mahatma Gandhi of India, he says, and I quote, it is health that is real worth and not pieces of gold or silver. Don't gain wealth. And in the process, you lose your head. Because your real wealth is your head, not the pieces of silver or gold that you put together in life. A lot of people have done so much to gain wealth in life. But in the process, they have lost their head. And now they are using the wealth that they have gathered in life to regain their lost head. That is not the right way to go in life. And that will not be your portion. So you must pay attention to your health. Your health is valuable. Your health is all you need to be able to live a good life. You must know that your body is all that you have in this world. And if you lose your body, you have no place to stay. Your body is your license to stay here on earth. So if you lose your body, that means you can't stay here again. So you must pay attention to your health. That's the first point I want to discuss with you. The second point I want to share with you, and that's the second thought I want to share with you, is that you are what you eat. Your diet speaks volume about your life. Eating well and eating right is the only way to go for a healthy life. When your diet is wrong, then medicine will be of use to you. But when your diet is right, medicine will be of no use. Michael Pollan said, and I quote, if it came from plants, eat. If it was made from a plant, don't. There's nothing that can be truer than that. That's the way to live your life. What you eat. You are to eat nature. Eat from plants. And don't eat from what is made in a plant. I pray you will understand that. It simply means eat nature. Eat your food most of the time raw. Cooking denature your food. Cooking destroy many of the vital vitamins, nutrients, and vital chemicals in your food. So you can't afford to be cooking all of the time. You must eat raw because you are what you eat. Your food should be in the natural form most of the time. You came from nature and you only live long by eating nature. Now, hypocrites, that ancient Greek physician said, and I quote, let the food be your medicine, and thy medicine shall be your food. If your food, if you eat your food as your medicine, definitely your medicine will be your food. You will not need any drugs. Your body will maintain balance by the right food. And now, not only the food you eat, but by the way you eat, you must know the portion to eat. You must know what to eat in the morning as breakfast. You must know what to eat in the afternoon as your lunch. And you must know 
what to eat as dinner. And you must know the timing of eating. You can't afford to be eating late every day. So your eating habit is very important for you to live long. Now I quote Thomas Edison, the doctors of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather we cure and prevent disease with nutrition. That is the discovery of that great American writer, Thomas Edison, American invent inventor. You must pay attention to your nutrition. That's the second point that I want to share with you. And the third point I want to share with you is about your lifestyle. I've talked about your health, I've talked about your diet, and I'm talking about your lifestyle. You must have the lifestyle that will promote health and not the lifestyle that will compromise your health. Regular moderate exercise should be what we engage in on a daily basis. Sedentary living is dangerous to your health. You, can't, you cannot afford to live your life always sitting down, always occupied, and always inactive. You must be on the move. You must move your body parts. You must move your legs. Move your hands. There are some steps you must take every day at the minimum. Thousands of steps at the minimum. And not only taking steps, you must consciously engage in any exercise regimen that is con 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 convenient for you. Moderate exercise. Is it brisk walking? Is it uh, going to the gym? Or any form of exercise. Cycling that you can engage in. You must exercise. It has been found, for example, that cancer cells are anaerobic. Cancer cells cannot stay in the body that is active, that is full of exercise. You take a lot of oxygen, a lot of oxygen when you exercise regularly. So your body is in shape. You must imbibe the lifestyle of active living, of exercise. And not only that, you must give all you can to keep fit. Fitness is key. Now, I want to quote what one renowned fitness coach has said. He said, your food is the queen, and the exercise is the king. So when you combine your food with exercise, then you have a kingdom. What a fantastic way to enjoy your life. So you must exercise, and then make sure that you keep at it. It's not what you do once and you leave. You must keep at it. Your head is your words. Your food is who you are. And exercise will keep you fit. I want you to sit back and enjoy the rest of the meal. And I'm sure you will live long and you will not be sick. God bless you. Tony Akiyemi is arguably the pioneer holistic health coach in Nigeria. He has been sharing his holistic elderly living message through radio, television, health seminars, newsletters, books, DVDs, CDs, and on social media for close to two decades now. Reverend Tony Akiyemi has several published books to his credit and is also a writer for many magazines and newsletters. He believes that most diseases are largely preventable. He also believes that what we need is not more medication, but more education. Akiyemi has earned three certifications in three different fields and has tremendous experiences in all three fields, spanning several years. He first earned a degree in computer engineering from the then University of Ife, Ileife, now called Obafemi Aolowo University. He was the chief engineer of Charms Nigeria Limited. He later obtained another degree in theology from Life Bible College. His third certification is in holistic nutritional consulting, which he obtained from the Natural Healing College in California. He is board certified as a holistic health practitioner by the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. Tony Akemi pastors the Shepherd's Flock International Church with headquarters in Ikeja, Lagos. He is married to Tutu, a chartered accountant and an MBA degree holder, and they are blessed with three great children, Melody, Lovelyn, and David. Ladies and gentlemen, with a standing ovation, let us make welcome 
our own Reverend Tony Akinyemi. Hello and welcome. My name is Tony Akinyemi, and I'm honored to be uh, speaking to you today on walking in perfect health. I want to offer you some practical steps for healthy living. But before then, I think we should share a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life. And we thank you for everything you have put in place to enable us to live life to the full. Today, we receive grace and wisdom from you as we share nuggets on healthy living. We ask that you help both the speaker as well as the hearers today to optimize, to maximize the wisdom that will be shared today. And in case anyone is sick, we pray that they will receive the words, the guidance that will navigate them out of disease into wellness. And for those who are well, we pray that they will learn how to keep it that way till the very end of their long and prosperous life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so walking in perfect health, practical steps for healthy living. Right. Maybe the right place to start will be, what is health? And I think the World Health Organization has done a very beautiful job in giving us a definition for that. The WHO says, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, unquote. So according to the World Health Organization, when we say someone is healthy, that person must have complete physical health, mental health, and social well-being. Once a person is sound at those three levels, the WHO says that person is a healthy person. But I want to add a fourth layer, okay? It's not just about physical wellness or mental wellness or social well-being. There's also the spiritual dimension, which the WHO left out. Well, we can also, we, we all understand that the WHO is a secular organization, so we don't expect them to talk about that dimension. But those of us who are people of faith, we know that the spiritual dimension is also critical. If somebody is sound physically, mentally, and socially, but the person is not sound spiritually, that person is sick, that person cannot be said to be healthy, okay? So it's important for us to understand that man is a tripartite being. We are three in one. In other words, we are spirits, we possess souls, and we live in bodies. And for us to maintain robust health, perfect health, we must be sound at the three levels. That's why the Bible says in 3 John verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Prosper in all things. 3 John verse 2. Not prosper in some things or prosper in many things, but prosper in all things. All your dimensions, you must prosper in them. Spiritually, solically and bodily, and then by extension, financially, okay? You must prosper mentally, you must prosper emotionally, you must prosper relationally. When you are sound in all of these areas, that's what we call perfect health. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Prosper in all things and be in health, prosper and be in health. I want you to take note of that, that's why I'm repeating it. And, the word and there is a conjunction that joins A to B. A and B. That means that A and B are not mutually exclusive. So it says that you may prosper and 
be in health, which means wealth and health are not mutually exclusive. You can have the two together at the same time. Pari pasu, in parallel, simultaneously. You don't have to lose one before you can get the other. You don't have to lose this one before you can get this one. You can have this one and this one. That's what the Bible says here in 3rd John verse 2. I pray that you may prosper and be in health. Some people lose their health in the process of building wealth. So at the end of the day, they gain wealth. They gain success. They gain significance. They become wealthy. They become rich financially. They become prominent. They become popular. They become famous. They become celebrities, okay? They have private jets. They can pay for almost anything that money can buy. Money is not their problem. Fame is not their problem. But then in the process of acquiring that wealth, many people lose their health in the process. So they make it look like the two are mutually exclusive. That you cannot have this one and this one. It's either this one or that one. The Bible says no. I pray that you may prosper wealth and be in health. So you can have the two together. So don't lose your health in the process of acquiring wealth. Because somebody has said, and I cannot agree more, that many people acquire wealth and lose their health in the process, and now they turn around to start spending their wealth to regain their lost health. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. We need to operate in wisdom. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. And in all you're getting, get understanding. You must understand. You must be wise. You must operate in wisdom. You must be balanced. So that you acquire wealth in a wise way such that you don't lose your health in the process. So by the time you have acquired success and significance, you have acquired wealth and fame, you don't lose your health, and now you are wasting your wealth to regain your health. That's why today I want to share with you practical steps, practical steps to be able to walk in perfect health. Things that you and I need to do so that as we pursue our life's visions, as we fulfill our divine assignments, as we fulfill purpose, we don't lose our health. We don't destroy our health. We don't damage our health in the process. Because once health is lost, almost everything is lost. Because when it comes to health and wellness, as well as our well-being, there are three options open to us. Option number one is the disease prevention option. Disease prevention. It's a paradigm. In other words, Today, I am not sick. By the grace of God, I am well, I am fine, I am fit. Everything about me, spirit, soul, and body is good. The question is, are there things I can begin to do now that I am well so that I don't fall sick, so that I can prevent disease in the future? Are there things I can begin to do from today in order not to fall sick tomorrow? Whatever strategy, whatever plan I institute and I am committed to, and I am implementing so that I don't fall sick tomorrow, those things are disease prevention strategies. And that is one paradigm. The first option is disease prevention. And not too many people are committed to that. Many people wait for the third option. I will get there. So option one is disease prevention option. Option two is the disease reversal option. In other words, Somebody has already been sick, already diagnosed with a disease condition. And then there are two options once a person is diagnosed with a disease condition. Oh, this person is diabetic or this person is hypertensive. There are two things. Option 2A is to say, well, I am not going to have anything of this disease. I am going to whip it. I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to divorce it. I am not going to live with this disease till my old age, till I die. No, 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 it's not going to happen. I'm going to file for a divorce with this disease. 
That is the mindset of disease reversal. In other words, are there things I can do to reverse this condition? For me to be cured of diabetes, cured of hypertension, cured of arthritis, or whatever diagnosis I have, that mentality, that mindset, and every strategy deployed, every action taken to get rid of that disease from your body, that is the disease reversal option. But there's a part B to that. Some people have been lied to. Hmm? Yes, I said lied to. Now, what do I mean? They have been told that that disease that they have is incurable. It cannot be reversed. Oh, once you have diabetes, you are diabetic for life. Oh, once you have hypertension, you are hypertensive for life. That is a mindset. That's a mentality. That is a belief system. And there are some people who preach that gospel. Well, should I call it gospel? They preach it. They preach that bad news because gospel is good news. It's not good news for anybody to tell you that that disease cannot be reversed. It cannot be cured. You just have to accept it. You just have to live with it. You just take your drugs and blah, 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 blah. Anybody who preaches that bad news to you is not telling you the gospel truth. The gospel truth is that there are no incurable diseases. There are only incurable people. And there's a world of difference between the two. The disease itself is not the problem. The person who has that disease usually is the problem. Because the moment that person who has that disease believes that that disease cannot be cured, that means he's not prepared to do anything to cure it because he believes it cannot be cured. So he accepts it, he begins to live with it for the rest of his life, and then he begins to implement the third option, which is the disease management option. Since they say this disease cannot be cured, I have to manage it. What does it mean to manage disease? It means that I take my drug in the morning, drug in the afternoon, drug in the evening, as I am told to do, so that this disease is not permitted to kill me, I am also not permitted to kill the disease. So we coexist together in peace, happily, Till death do us part. That is the disease management mindset. Am I saying you should not take drugs? No, that's not what I'm saying. There are times when drugs are necessary in the meantime. And I want you to mark my words. Drugs may be necessary in the meantime to keep things under control, to stabilize you, to help you to prevent complications, to help you to buy time while you are investigating what to do to reverse the disease. But before you can embark on disease reversal, you have to first of all be persuaded. You have to be convinced. You have to believe that this condition indeed can be reversed. To say that a disease cannot be reversed is simply to be arrogant in ignorance. <laughs> Arrogance in ignorance. Oh, this thing cannot be cured. Now, when we say a disease is incurable, it doesn't mean that there is no cure for the disease. It simply means that, yes, we may not have found the cure for the disease. But the, the cure for the disease exists somewhere. Only we have not discovered it. Only we have not found it. Or maybe it has been discovered, but we have rejected it. We have refused to accept it, that this thing can cure. There were people who were told that the only option for them was to go to, uh, to do surgery, surgical removal of their body parts. And I tell them, look, there is another way out. For example, if somebody has gallbladder stones, gallbladder stones, the doctors, will typically, the doctors will typically tell them the only option is surgery. Just come, let us cut out your gallbladder. You can live without your gall, gallbladder, and that's the only option. And I say, no, that's not the only option. There is a 48-hour remedy, 48 hours. You will poop out all the gallstones in your gallbladder painlessly. Painlessly, you won't feel any pain at all. You won't even know when the thing is passing from your gallbladder through your bile duct into your digestive tract, and then you poopoo -poo it with your poopoo. -poo. And you can see the gallstones in your poopoo. -poo. Okay? So until you believe that it is possible, you are not likely going to take steps. All right? So the three options again are disease prevention, disease reversal, and disease management. Whether you believe it or not, each one of us is living by one of these three options. Your life is being lived by the principles of one of these options or the other. Either you are living by the disease prevention principle. In other words, you are proactive and you are preemptive. You are taking steps to prevent disease. 
Or you are living by the disease reversal option. You're already diagnosed and you believe that you can whip this disease. Or you are living by the disease management option. You have accepted the fact, maybe not a fact, the lie, that it cannot be reversed. And so you have accepted that, yes, I will just manage it till I die. Okay. Now let me give you a very powerful quote by one evangelist in the United States of America. It's late now. He, he used to live in Texas. Evangelist Lester Roloff. He said a very powerful and profound statement, and I quote, he said, I believe it is a sin to be sick if you could be well. I believe it is a sin to be sick if you could be well. <laughs> That's very profound, very powerful by evangelist Lester Roloff. Okay, now let me move on and tell us the three stakeholders in our health. There are three stakeholders when it comes to our health. In other words, who are the people who are involved in defining our health? And I, I, if, you, if you can see the, the, uh, uh, the image on the screen, you see God as the biggest of the three. And then you, the next biggest of the three. And then others, the smallest. So you have the biggest, the bigger, <laughs> and the big. <laughs> Okay, now, these are the three stakeholders in defining our health. God has a stake in your health. You have a stake in your health. And others also have a stake in your health. Now, let me define others because I'm sure you're familiar with God, you're familiar with you. But who are these others? The others include your friends, your family. They include your neighbors, your colleagues your employers, maybe your church family, they include governments, they include institutions like hospitals and what have you. All of these various people and institutions have contributions to make to our health. All of them are lumped together to others. Then you also have a stake in your own health. And then of course, God Almighty, our creator, our savior, our redeemer, our great physician, Jehovah Rapha, also has a stake in our health. Now, all these three categories have something to contribute towards attaining perfect health or maintaining perfect health or walking in perfect health. Now, let me go back to the biggest God. God gave us life. He created us. He breathed his breath of life into us. We became living souls. And God can heal us. God can fix any part that is bad in our body, okay? Now, manufacturers of uh, equipment, of uh, vehicles, of machines, of different things, they, they have spare parts such that when that equipment develops a fault, they can troubleshoot and find which part of the machine or the equipment has a problem, and then they can bring a good brand new spare part, remove the bad spare part, and replace it with another one, and the machine continues to function. Okay? Now, if human beings who are inventors and manufacturers know how to do that, how much more the Almighty God? From our heads to our toes, every system in our body, every organ in our body, every gland in our body, every tissue in our body, every cell in our body, God has spare parts in his warehouse in heaven. That's why we pray for divine healing. God can remove a bad part in your body and give you a brand new part in your body. He can replace your kidneys. He can replace your liver. He can replace your heart. He can replace your prostate. He can replace your thyroid gland. There's no part of your body that God cannot miraculously replace. He can heal. He can quicken. He can repair. He can restore. He can rejuvenate. That's why he's Jehovah Rapha. That's why I personally believe in divine healing. I believe in miracles. I pray for people. I lay hands on people. I anoint people for them to be well when they are sick. And I have seen the miracles of God in that dimension. God is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. And he is also a major stakeholder in our health. Apart from that supernatural provision, which we are going to talk about later, he has also made arrangements for natural provisions that we can, you know, take advantage of in order for us to maintain good health or even to reverse disease conditions. So God has a part to play. We'll come back to that later. You and I also have 
our own part to play in defining our health, in walking in perfect health. If we fail in our responsibilities, if we fail to do our part, if we fail to be disciplined, if we fail to be knowledgeable in knowing what to do and commit to doing what we know to do, then we are irresponsible. Yeah? Some people say, well, I'm living by faith. I don't have to watch my diet. I don't have to exercise. I don't have to obey all these healthy living rules that they talk about all over the place. Mm -hmm, really? Any faith that abdicates responsibility is an irresponsible faith. Faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible says. So you are a major stakeholder. So what you need to do, find out what is your part to play in walking in perfect health. And then receive grace from God to be able to play your part, okay? And then the others can also play their parts. You need to work in meaningful and profitable, empowering relationships with others. Because that is part of our, you know, our, uh, the things that will keep us healthy. Our mental health, our emotional health, you know, social connection, family relationships, Living in a community of people, they contribute to our well-being. When you are isolated, that in itself can lead to mental health issues. All right? So others also have a part to play. Sometimes you need the support of others. Maybe financial support, maybe emotional support, maybe spiritual support, maybe prayer and intercession for you. Okay? Or to play games together, do sports together, do social outings together. All of these things contribute to health. Going to church together, having family relationship, church family relationship, all of these things support our health. When you don't participate in social activities, group activities, team activities, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot. That's why in Hebrews 10.25, the Bible says we must not forsake the assembling together of one another as is the manner of some, the habit of some. They don't know that they are losing spiritually, they are losing emotionally, they are losing mentally, they are losing health-wise when they don't, you know, socialize or associate with the right kind of people. All right. So God is a stakeholder, you are a stakeholder, others are stakeholders. Now among the three, the biggest stakeholder, of course, is God. We give it to him. But the next biggest stakeholder is not your doctor, it's not your nurse, it's not your healthcare provider. The next biggest stakeholder in defining your health, in working in perfect health, next to God, is you. You. You are the next biggest stakeholder. All the others, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, physiotherapists, physical therapists, psychologists, uh, family, friend, employment, uh, employers, uh, governments, uh, hospitals, institutions, all of them, they are the third most important. They are the least important. The most important is God. The next most important is you. And then others come third. Once you understand that priority, that arrangement, things will go well. Okay? When it comes to God, God has played his part. There's nothing left for God to do for us as far as our wellness is concerned. He has made supernatural provisions. He has made natural provisions. And he has also made uh, the provisions in the realm of knowledge and wisdom, which I refer to as medical science or science in general. He's made them available. What are the supernatural provisions that God has made available? In the Bible, we are told that we can lay hands on the sick, they will recover. That's the supernatural means of ministering health and healing. There's anointing with oil. Is any sick among you, James chapter 5, let the elders of the church anoint him with oil. The prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Even if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And then the Bible also says that the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is within us can quicken our mortal body. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. Romans 8, 11. That's a spiritual provision, supernatural provision. Then there are spiritual gifts, the gifts of healing that God has endowed the church with to minister to the sick. You also have faith in your heart. The Bible says when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, God gave you the measure of faith. And now the just shall live by faith. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. When you exercise your faith in the word of God, in the promises of God, with his stripes I am healed. 
himself took my infirmity, okay, and you believe God according to his word that he has spoken to you. If you look at Proverbs uh, chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, it says that the word of God is medicine to our, to our bodies, okay? So the stripes of Jesus, faith, the promises of God, the gifts of healing, anointing of the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, anointing with oil, the laying on of hands, all of these are supernatural means that God has already arranged for us to walk in perfect health. And then he has also made natural provisions available. He has given us herbs. Uh -huh. Some antennas are up now. Some red flags are up now. Herbs. Huh? God gave us herbs. Are we herbalists? <laughs> yeah. What is wrong in being a herbalist? A herbalist is different from a witch doctor. Okay? A herbalist simply means somebody who understands the medicinal uses of herbs. Yeah. That's a herbalist. A witch doctor is what in Nigeria... In southwest Nigeria, we call Babalawo. In some other parts of uh, Africa, they, they call them Sangoma. <laughs> in other places, they, they call it Voodoo. Okay? Witch doctors are those who invoke spirits, who do incantations. They are spiritists. They, they work in tandem with Satan and with demons to invoke satanic powers, you know, to cast spells and to do all kinds of different things. That is a witch doctor. But a herbalist is somebody who understands the uses of herbs. And God has given us herbs to use for our health. You can read that in Ezekiel. You can read that in, in Revelation 22. And then in Psalm 104, verses 13, 14, and 15, you will see there that God says in his word that he has given us herbs for the service of man. Psalm 104, particularly, uh, I think, verse 14 there. He says he has given us herbs for the service of man. So God has given us herbs in nature. He has given us sunshine. The Bible says the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. He has given us water to hydrate. When you are dehydrated, you can fall sick. He has given us oxygen to oxygenate the body. Science has discovered when somebody is low on oxygen, all kinds of diseases can develop, including cancer, including infectious diseases because of Poor oxygenation of the body. And when the body is properly oxygenated, certain diseases just vamoose. They just disappear. And air is free in the atmosphere. Except you go to an hospital where they place you on oxygen, then you pay for that one. God has given us food for therapeutic purposes, to heal, for prophylactic purposes, to prevent disease, for geriatric purposes, to help us to age gracefully. He has given us food for economic purposes, to make money. I mean, vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, and then vitamins, minerals, and all kinds of things. These are all natural provisions of God, and he has made them available. And then he has given us knowledge and wisdom as human beings that we can learn, we can understand, we can understand the dynamics of how things work, and then take advantage of the understanding we have and apply the knowledge. That is wisdom. The right and timely application of knowledge is called wisdom. So we have medical systems out there that God has endowed humanity with knowledge, with understanding, allopathic medicine, with all the surgeries, with all the different therapies and modalities and protocols to save lives and to help people to operate and live in health. We have osteopathy, we have naturopathy, chiropractic medicine, homeopathy, and even traditional Chinese medicine and traditional, I mean, African traditional medicine, all kinds of different ways. In nature, scientifically proven to be able to help us to live long and to walk in health. These are the three dimensions that God has made provisions. The supernatural dimension, the natural dimension in nature, and then the knowledge and wisdom that God has endowed human beings with that we can deploy in order to enjoy robust health. Okay, so long-term robust health is possible only when we harness these three dimensions of God's gracious provisions, the divine healing and divine health dimension, supernatural, the natural provisions, fruits, vegetables, and herbs, and what have you, and then the knowledge and understanding dimension in science. Okay? Like I said in the beginning, we are tripartite beings, so we must take care of ourselves at all three dimensions, spirit, soul, and body. That's how we can walk in perfect health. So right now, let me move to the second part of my presentation by giving you practical steps that you and I need to take for healthy living. In other words, 
God, the first stakeholder, has already done his part. Now it is the second biggest, next biggest stakeholder, you and me. What should we do? What practical steps should we take? God has done his part. What is my part and what should I do? And then the third one will be what should others do? Today we are not going to concern ourselves with what others should do for us. We are going to concern ourselves with what we should do for ourselves. Okay, so the first practical step I am going to suggest that I am going to propose that you and I should undertake in order for us to walk in perfect health, in robust health, in good health for the rest of our days, the first practical step is education. Education, okay? Uh, I have developed 21 principles of healthy living in my training school, I, we have an institute, Rafa Institute of Healthy Living. Uh, we have online courses. You can enroll, uh, module one, module two, module three, and so on and so forth. Now, we have developed in one of my lectures that I deliver in, in the Rafa Institute, 21 principles of healthy living. The very first principle there is the principle of knowledge. And that principle says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's in the Bible, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So lack of knowledge is costly. Ignorance can be destructive. The Bible says in the book of John in the Bible, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In Proverbs chapter 11, if you read verses 8 and 9, it says, for by knowledge shall the just be delivered. The righteous the just will be delivered by knowledge, not by the anointing here, but by knowledge. Of course, the anointing has its place, okay? But knowledge also has its place. For by knowledge shall the just be delivered. So the principle of education is the first practical step that you and I must take. Because you see, what you don't know, you don't know. And what you don't know may be killing you. Some people have some health challenges, and they don't know that there are certain things that aggravate the health challenge, and they continue to ignorantly indulge in the very things that are worsening their disease condition. And they don't know. And they are the ones putting more petrol, more fuel into the fire, damaging themselves. That's why I have an axiom that I always share in my program, on TV, on radio, on social media, every platform I have. I say what we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. The best prescription is knowledge. So the first practical step you must take if you want to walk in perfect health is equip yourself with knowledge. The right kind of knowledge, the right kind of information, because you see, when you are informed, properly informed, you will be transformed. But when you are uninformed, you will be deformed. Information is what brings transformation. So get equipped. Get knowledge. And I'm happy we are doing this today. This is part of the steps to get knowledge, to get equipped, to get informed, to know your right from your left, to know what to do. Because when you don't know, you can be misled through propaganda. How many of you know that most things we call advertisement are actually propaganda? Propaganda. Because advertisers actually simply want to sway you. They want you to, to, you know, direct you to their product so you can buy their product, use their product, so they can have a good market share, a good profit and smile to the bank. And if you don't know whether that product they're advertising to you is healthy or not healthy, you just go for it because you don't know any better. But if you know, you make informed decisions informed choices. And once you are deciding correctly and choosing correctly your diet and your lifestyle in particular, then you will work in perfect health. But if you don't know, you can choose wrongly, you can decide wrongly, and that can have you know, implications, negative consequences. So information, knowledge, very, very important. Educate yourself on matters of health and healthy living. That's the first practical step. The first practical step to take to walk in, you know, in perfect health. 
learn and learn and learn. Get informed. Get informed. And so I invite you, you know, I have a free channel on YouTube where you can learn and learn and learn and learn. Every week, every week, I deliver 30 minutes to 45 minutes talk on wellness and health, healthy living, free of charge. It's on YouTube, it's on Facebook. You can join me, 8 p.m. West African time. 8 p.m. West African time, every Monday. Every Monday, 8 p.m. West African time. It's called Expose with Tony Akiyami. 8 p.m. on YouTube, on Facebook, West African time, every Monday evening. Okay, and it's continuous education. Continuous education, continuous education, because what we need is not more medication, but more education. That's how to work in perfect health. Get educated, get informed, okay? You need to know your body, your body systems, your cells, your tissues, your organs, your glands, your systems, the entire human body. You see, many of us don't even know our body parts. Some men come to me and they tell me at the age of 60, they say, ah, pastor, uh, I need help. I said, what do you need help for? They said, they say I have prostate. <laughs> I said, me too, I have prostate. Every man has prostate. So what's the big deal about having a prostate? <laughs> they never knew they had a gland in their body called the prostate until they were diagnosed with a prostate disorder. What they are trying to tell me is, oh, I have been diagnosed with a prostate disorder. There are different kinds of disorders that can happen to the prostate in a man. There can be prostate inflammation known as prostatitis or prostate enlargement known as benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, or prostate cancer, prostate neoplasm. Okay, so maybe somebody has been diagnosed with prostate cancer or prostate enlargement, and he says, they say I have prostate. Uh -huh. You've always had a prostate since you were born as a baby boy. <laughs> what you now have is a problem with your prostate. But they never knew. Nobody ever educated them. Nobody ever told them that they have something in their body, a gland that is called prostate, part of their reproductive system. And that that prostate can develop problems. They were never told the kind of problems that can happen to their prostate. They were never told how to take care of their prostate so that it doesn't develop problems. So you need to educate yourself, equip yourself with your dif different parts of your body. Many women don't understand the different parts of their bodies and how to take care of their bodies. They don't know how to prevent fibroid, for example. They have no knowledge, no understanding. They don't know about nutrition, the kind of deficiencies that can create problems in their health, the kind of you know, excesses that can create problems in their health. So knowledge is important. Now, the second practical step that you must take to work in perfect health is what I call the principle of abstinence. There are things you must abstain from if you want to maintain health. I hear some people say, well, I can eat anything, anything, anything. I don't know where they're getting that from. Check your Bible. The Bible never suggests that you eat anything. There are guidelines. Is it in the Garden of Eden when God created the first man and the first woman? He told them what to eat and what not to eat. The tree, there was a tree in the garden that God said they shouldn't eat. That's the principle of abstinence right from the beginning. Ab initio. When God was migrating his covenant people, the Israelites, from Egypt into the promised land, he gave them a list, Leviticus chapter 11, of what they should not eat, unclean things that they should not eat. And as long as they lived by those guidelines, the principle of abstinence, the Bible says there was not one feeble one among them. For 40 years, they walked through the, uh, the, the wilderness. Now, the combination of God's supernatural hand upon them and the dietary guidelines that God gave them, including the principle of abstinence, combined to keep them in perfect health for 40 years. Not one feeble one among them. In the New Testament, people tell me, after all, the Bible says everything God has created must be accepted with thanksgiving and, and it should be sanctified with the word of prayer. Mm. Okay, why not go and harvest poisonous mushroom? Is it not God who also created that one and then sanctify it by the word of prayer and eat it and see what happens to your liver? Liver damage, liver failure. All the animals, all the insects that God created, is it all of them that are edible? Why did God give us common sense? Why did God give us wisdom to be able to discern, to know what is good for us and what is not good for us? When we want to indulge, we simply say, eh, I can eat anything. Acts of the Apostles, go and read chapter 15. 
from verse 22. The Jerusalem Council of Apostolic Elders actually sent letters to the Gentile churches and they told them, you don't have to follow all the Jewish laws and all the Levitical laws, okay? So, but we advise you to abstain from, and they gave them a list of things to abstain from. One of them is abstain from blood, abstain from strangulated animals. Abstain from anything offered to idols. Abstain from fornication. There are things you must abstain from in your own interest. That's what the Bible teaches. Abstinence. You must abstain from certain things to maintain perfect health. There are people who indulge in sexual immorality, and as a result, they contract sexually transmitted infections, sexually transmitted diseases. There are people who indulge in tobacco, and they not damage their own lungs. There are people who do drugs, social drugs, hard drugs, and they damage their health. Some people develop mental problems, psychiatric problems, because of indulgence. There is this principle of plus and minus principle that I have developed. In fact, I have a video on YouTube and Facebook for that. You can go and check it out. Just put expose with Tony Akemi and then put plus and minus principle. It will bring it out for you on YouTube. You can watch it. There are things that are not good for your health. You must be sensible and disciplined enough to abstain from them. Otherwise, you compromise your health. So to work in perfect health, this principle of abstinence must be operational in your life. It takes wisdom, common sense, which is not common, as well as discipline to be able to do that. And where you need help, where you need the grace of God, why not call for it? God will give you grace. So second, Practical step is to eliminate all disease-causing and disease-promoting foods, drinks, habits, and substances from your life, from your diet, from your lifestyle. Let's go to the third practical step. And that is what I call moderation. Or in order to create homeostasis. You know, what is moderation? Moderation means that, okay, even things that are permitted, things that you don't have to eliminate. You have to still do them moderately. Don't overdo them. You have to minimize or reduce certain legitimate items and elements to a tolerable level in your life. Yes, these things are part and parcel of life. You cannot do without them. They are needed. But in excess, they can damage your health. We all need a certain amount of stress in our lives to keep us on our toes. You see, guitar strings, you have to tune the guitar string and let it have some tension, you know, to get the right sound. If the tension is not right, if it's too low, you won't get the right sound. And if, it's, if the tension is too much, the guitar string can actually snap and you ruin it. So there is this balance, the normal tension in each string to give you the right sound. So in our lives, we do need a certain amount of stress to keep us on our toes, to help us to be productive, to help us to be able to meet our timelines and deadlines. When you don't have that healthy amount of stress in your lives, you become laid back and unproductive, or you underperform. But when you have too much stress in your life, that becomes distress, okay? Normal stress is called eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -S, eustress. But too much stress, chronic stress, acute stress, that's called, that leads to distress. That can damage your health. So moderate it. Stress management. You need to also moderate your body weight. If you don't have enough body weight, you are underweight. That's not healthy. If you have too much body weight, you are overweight or obese, that can also compromise your health. It can make you vulnerable for heart diseases, other cardiovascular problems, hypertension, stroke, and what have you. It can make you vulnerable for uh, metabolic diseases, you know, like diabetes, for example. So moderate your body weight, ideal body weight. Find out what your body mass index is and use that to calculate your ideal body weight. Moderate. The amount of cooked food you eat, moderate it. Don't eat cooked food three times a day. Breakfast, cooked food, lunch, cooked food, supper, cooked food. That's not good. You have to introduce some raw food, fresh fruits, raw nuts, raw vegetables, vegetable juices, smoothies, and what have you, nut milk. That's moderation, balance, to create homeostasis. Walk, 
When you overwork, that's workaholism. That can damage your health. When you underwork, that's laziness, indolence. That will make you poor. <laughs> so balance, moderation. Even sleep. If you don't sleep enough, you become sick. If you sleep too much, you become poor. So moderation. That's what we mean by the principle of moderation. It's a practical step. Don't do good things in excess. Eliminate bad things completely, but the good things you have to do, you cannot do without them. Moderate them. Maintain a life of balance in this category. That's the third practical thing to do. The fourth practical thing to maintain perfect health is environmental sanitation and hygiene. Maintain some hygiene in your environment, at home and in your body. Trim your nails, okay, brush your teeth, clean your environment. Don't allow stagnant water to breed mosquitoes and what have you. Maintain personal hygiene. Keep your environment clean. That will stem the tide of communicable diseases in particular. All right. The fourth practical thing to do is detoxification. Detoxify your body. Put your waste elimination system on turbo. Get rid of gaseous waste, liquid waste, solid waste from your body. Gaseous waste, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Liquid waste, you urinate, you sweat. Solid waste, you poo, -poo every day. Regular bowel movement. If you are not pooping every day, something is wrong. Your diet is not right. Your digestive system is not functioning well. You are constipated. And that can lead to diseases. So to work in good health, you need to make sure your elimination system is on turbo. And waste products are being eliminated efficiently and in a timely manner. Okay. The sixth principle is the principle of nourishment. Good nutrition. Consume foods and drinks that will help to nourish your body so you don't have any nutritional deficiency. You are not deficient in carbohydrates. You are not deficient in fats and oil. You are not deficient in, in proteins. You are not deficient in the trace uh, nutrients, in the micronutrients, minerals, trace minerals, vitamins, and even things like enzymes, food enzymes, and what have you. So nourish your body to prevent deficiency diseases. And then, when you nourish your body properly, you actually, you, you bolster your immune system. Your immune system is balanced, it's strong to be able to fight disease on your behalf. Then, when you nourish yourself properly, you also provide the building blocks for your body to rebuild any part of your body that is failing, to speed up the recovery from disease, the recovery process, to promote health and wellness. Nourishment is very key, very foundational. The seventh practical thing to do to work in good health and robust health is never get dehydrated. The principle of hydration. You have to drink sufficient amount of water. Most experts agree on the fact that you need about eight glasses of water every day. Your water must be clean, purified, must be alkaline, mineral rich, structured water, okay? And make water your best beverage. Not coffee, not tea, not uh, uh, other beverages. Water should be your best beverage if you want to walk in robust health. The eighth practical step is exercise. Regular, moderate exercise. Exercise moderately on a regular basis. 30 minutes to 60 minutes, at least four times a week. That's good enough. If you can do it every day, perfect. And do the exercises in the three categories. Aerobic exercises, flexibility or stretching exercises, and then weight-bearing exercises. Those are the three categories. 30 minutes to 60 minutes, four days a week or every day in the week, that's part of your practical steps, okay? Don't be sedentary. Uh, practical step number nine is the principle of rest. Rest as appropriate. If you don't rest, somebody may soon lay you to rest, God forbid. If you don't learn to rest, People may soon lay you to rest, God forbid. So there must be daily rest, weekly rest, annual rest. Daily rest, six to eight hours of sleep, depending on your state of health. Weekly rest, there must be one day off every week that you, you slow down and relax. And then annual rest, go on at least two to six weeks vacation every year. Principle number 10 is the principle of sunshine. Receive adequate sunshine on your body daily. About one hour sunshine helps you to manufacture vitamin D. Again, I have a lot of videos on YouTube on that. I call it sensible sunshine 
exposure. Principle number 11, which is your 11 practical step to take to work in perfect health is to be proactive. What do I mean by that? Do regular medical checkups to ascertain your current state of health. Don't wait until you start feeling some symptoms, some pains, and some problems in your body before you now go to the hospital. While you are well, when you are not sick, that is the right time, the correct time to visit the hospital, to see your doctor. Let them check everything. Do your blood test, your urine test, your stool test, and everything that needs to be done to be sure that nothing is brewing inside your body. Because when diseases begin to brew in the body, there may be no symptoms at all. It may be asymptomatic. It is usually, in many cases, when it has become a big problem that you begin to see the symptoms. At that time, sometimes it may be rather too late to reverse or maybe too expensive to reverse. And many people can't afford the therapies to reverse them. And so they go down with it. But if you are proactive, a practical step, check your liver function, your kidney function, your urinalysis and urine culture, do your blood test, your complete you know, blood count, do your uh, everything that you need to do. Your doctor will guide you in that. That's a practical step to take. Many believers will say, oh, no, I don't want to go to the hospital for a medical checkup. They will always find something. They will tell me I have this. I don't want to hear bad news. That is not wisdom. Be proactive. Be preemptive, okay? The twelfth practical thing is to maintain a state of joy all the time. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Regular laughter. The Bible says laughter, a merry heart, is as good as medicine. Be happy. The Bible actually prescribes in the New Testament, in 1 Thessalonians, it says rejoice evermore. In Philippians, Paul the Apostle wrote, in chapter 4, verse 4, he wrote, to the, to the Philippian Christian. Paul was in prison. He was writing to people who were out of prison. He said, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Can you imagine? He understood the power of joy, the power of rejoicing. When you are happy, when you are rejoicing, your body releases endorphins. Endorphins are natural analgesics and mild antidepressants. Endorphins. You churn them out when you are laughing, free of charge. But when you are frowning, when you are sad, when you are sorrowful, when you are angry, you churn out adrenaline and cortisol, and those things will fry you. So rejoice evermore, okay? Proverbs 17, 22, it says, a merry heart does good like medicine. All right, so have clean fun all the time. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30, the A part in the Living Bible, it says, a relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. A relaxed attitude lengthens a man's life. You want your life to be long? Relax. God is in control. In, in the Amplified Version, Proverbs 14.30 says, A calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. A calm and undisturbed mind, the heart and the life uh, and the health of the body. And the 13th, Practical step is safety consciousness. Be safety conscious in order to prevent accidents. The 14th one is to maintain healthy relationships. Watch the association you keep. Because the association you keep will either raise or erase you. The Bible says good communication is what we should do. Evil communication, bad communication corrupts good manners. In Proverbs, the Bible says a, a, a righteous man chooses his friends carefully. So do not isolate yourself. Make meaningful social connections. I told you about Hebrews 10.25 before. Don't forsake the assembly of one another. Cultivate, nurture, and enjoy your God-given and God-ordained relationships. Um, practical step number 15, engage in spiritual warfare. Resist the devil steadfastly in the faith. Okay? There is a spiritual component. Don't be prayerless. The Bible says, watch and pray. Your adversary, the enemy, is walking around like a roaring lion, looking for whom to devour. You are not going to be a victim of his. If you don't want to be a prey of the devil, you must be alert spiritually. And number 16, practical step to maintain robust health is to be a worshiper of God. Exodus chapter 23, verses 25 and 26, you say, you will worship me and I will bless your bread and your water and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. 
In Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, I will spare them as a father spares his son that serves him. And I will make a distinction, a difference between them that serve me and them that do not serve me. Malachi chapter 3, read verses 17 and 18. So be a worshiper of God and God will be jealous over you and will spare your life. Practical step number 17 is what I call word therapy. Meditate on God's word to build your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now the just shall live by his faith. When your faith is strong, you can overcome temptations, you can overcome attacks, you can overcome anything the enemy brings at you. Because you have the shield of faith to ward it off. And that faith will be built by meditating on the word. Word therapy. Exodus 23, verse 26, the B part says, I will give you a full lifespan. Psalm 91, verse 16, God says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. I read 3 John 2 to you in the beginning. It says, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And the 18th practical step is the attitude of gratitude. Maintain an attitude of gratitude, contentment, godliness. Okay, the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. And, and I'll give you this final one, practical step. Find your purpose in life and start pursuing that purpose. Okay, that will make your life to count. When you find a reason to live and something to live for, you won't have time to mess around with disease. May God keep you. May God preserve you. See, all these practical steps I have shared can be modularized into four modules. There are those that have to do with our relationship with God, worship, service. There are those that have to do with our relationship with ourselves, you know, the things you have to do by yourself, for yourself, in your own interest, and good self-esteem. There are those that have to do with, with your relationship with others, building friendly relationships and, and being a good team player. And there are those that have to do with your relationship with your environment, the air, the water, the sun, the food that you eat, nature, sanitation, and what have you. All of these things come together. Now, in tying everything up, let me say this. I ask the question, what is the whole point? Why do I have to live in perfect health for a long time? I want to be 90 years old before I die. I want to be 100 years old before I die. I want to be 120 years old before I die. Okay, let's assume that God has played his part and I play my part. Others play their part to help me achieve 120 years of good health on earth. What is the whole point? That's the question. What's the bottom line? Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7 says, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Any life, no matter how long, no matter how healthy, no matter how wealthy, that is not committed to doing the will of God is a wasted life. What's the whole point? It is so that we can enjoy long life on the one hand, robust health on the other hand, prosperity as well, so that we can commit all of this to do the will of God, to fulfill divine purpose and our divine assignments. I conclude with Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. It says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. May the Lord help you and help me so that we can live our lives for God and make our time on earth count for God. So we are not just doing everything to live long and enjoy good health and use that strength, that long life, that good health to serve our own selfish ends or even probably to serve the devil's, the devil's agenda, but to use it to serve God. The Lord bless you. Thank you for your time. It's been a wonderful moment, I believe. Father, I pray that you breathe upon this word. Heal those who are sick. Deliver them from affliction and grant everyone long life peace and prosperity, to do your will, to fulfill destiny, that your name may receive glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Love you. Bye. Five F Conference will be right back. Calling all leaders. 
Do you long to be a catalyst for change in your organization and community? Ignite transformation and make a meaningful impact on the world. This is your moment. At the 2023 Global Leadership Summit, you'll experience two transformative days full of inspiration, insights, and resources, all designed to help you push your boundaries and maximize your influence. At the 2023 Summit, you'll hear from world-class leaders like Secretary Condoleezza Rice, Craig Rochelle, Patrick Lencioni, Liz Bohannon, and so many more. No matter your place or your position, the summit will empower you to lead wisely, to lead boldly, to lead where you are. As you work towards your next goal, your next milestone, your next season, you don't have to wait for permission to grow. You can lead right where you are. All across the world, there are hundreds of thousands of leaders like you in business, in government, in schools, churches, and nonprofits who are gathering together as one community for one event, the Global Leadership Summit. And you're invited. Experience transformative teaching, art, and storytelling, all designed to help you push your boundaries and maximize your influence to create a better world. At the 2023 Summit, you'll hear from world-class leaders like Patrick Lincioni, Liz Bohannon, James Clear, Aaron Meyer, Ryan Leek, Pat Gelsinger, Francesca Gino, Dave Ramsey, Anita Elbers, Albert Tate, and Craig Rochelle. No matter your place or your position, the Summit will empower you to lead wisely, to lead boldly, to lead where you are. Register today. Welcome back to 5F Conference. Praise the Lord. We give all glory to God for tonight's session. God indeed showed up. And we thank our Father and the Lord, Reverend Tony Akiemi, for exposing us to, you know, a lot of secrets about fitness. Thank you so much, sir. God bless and strengthen you in Jesus' name. Uh, the program continues tomorrow by 11 a.m. in this same worshipatorium. And we expect that Everyone will be here live. It's going to be a great time in God's presence. You know for yourself that tonight's session was wow. And tomorrow is going to be exceptional. You can't miss it for anything. So we encourage everyone to be here. And God will bless you as you do in Jesus' name. Uh, let's give our offering. Let's give our offering tonight. Displayed on our screen are the online giving channels. Let's explore this channel to give our offering. And as we do so, God bless us in Jesus' name. Uh, once again, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight. We, we appreciate you, and we can't thank you enough. And we, we, we also look forward to having you here live tomorrow. And we pray that God himself will direct your steps here in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. God bless you. And let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, O oh God, for the offering Thank you for the pockets that this offering uh, uh, came from. We give you all glory. Thank you, God, because we know that you bless and, and increase them on all sides in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as your people uh, 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 go tonight, oh God, we ask, oh God, that your presence, Lord, will rest with them in their various locations in the name of Jesus. And Lord, by 11 a.m. tomorrow, we'll all be here to also fellowship and to learn at your feet. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. God bless you.